About two years ago, I released this tutorial creating this 3D photo parallax effect inside of Fusion using image planes. But the limitation with this approach is it's not flexible enough to adapt to any number of photos. You'd have to tediously set up an individual image plane for like 900 photos or whatever. And if you try to save this as a reusable Fusion macro, you would only be able to use this with the exact same number of media sources. So I had a different idea that still accomplishes the same effect, but this is a lot more flexible approach. In fact, I went ahead and created a template that you can download from the link below. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how the template works and also uh, how the template works. After you download and install the DRFX file from the link below, you'll find it under generators. It's called photo roll. I'm just gonna drag and drop this straight onto my timeline. And I'll just go ahead and stretch this out to about a minute or so. And I'm gonna come up here to import media and hit browse. And I'm just gonna select any of these images. You'll notice that the file names are all the same with a number attached. So if I click on any of these, it's gonna bring in the whole image sequence together. And so this is really the backbone for how this effect works. Unfortunately, it does not work with videos and you will have to have your files named in a sequential order like this. I'll show you how to do that if your files are kind of random names a little bit later on in this video. And over here, you've got all these different controls for things like your speed. So let me go ahead and just type in like four just for the demo. And now you can see those photos will start to fly in much quicker. You can also change the direction if you want them to kind of fall down like this. Uh, there's also a reverse order, so by default it's going to pull all of these images in chronologically, but if you want them to go backwards, you can just reverse the order here. So let me go ahead and reset these, and under layout you can control uh, things like your Y offset, you can push this over to the left or the right side, you can change the size of the images, you can rotate them, you can even rotate the entire stack of photos. So you could rotate your images by like 90 degrees and then in your Z rotation do something like negative 90. And of course now your Y offset kind of becomes your X offset, but this is a pretty simple way to do like a horizontal scroll, just another option. And so you can really customize this and get all different kinds of layouts for your images. And then under scatter, if you want to add a little bit more randomness, you've got some X variants, some Z variants, size variants like this and you can also reseed a few times if you want to kind of pick from different random layouts here so pretty easy to use i think the controls uh, should make common sense now there's a rotation variance slider here which will give every image a random rotation value not to be confused with spin up here in the movement tab so the rotation doesn't rotate over time it's just giving these images whatever rotation you want right here but the spin slider this one will actually animate over time so if i reset my rotation variance and let's just increase the spin to about like 1.5 uh, let's actually lower the speed to zero just so that you can really see this so now each image will have like a slight rotation. And this can also be reseeded too. So if you reseed this, this will impact all the parameters that have a random component to them. So your X variance, your Z variance, size variance, rotation variance, and the spin up here. So let me just go ahead and reset these sliders a little bit. And right down here, you also have lighting, which is turned off by default because it is a little bit heavy. It will add to the render time, but it's kind of like the last thing that you would probably want to set up anyway. So once you have your speed, your layout, your scatter controls uh, set up how you like it, you have the option to turn on these uh, shadows right there. And what's cool about this is they are fully responsive. So like if I rotate around here, maybe we'll reseed a few times to find a different layout to show this off. So you can see there's a faint little shadow there. You can, of course, increase the strength of those shadows as well as the blur. And you also have the light source position right here. So you can move this left and right. Let's actually move the Y offset up a little bit. And there's also a default kind of like a dark gray background. You can disable this if you want just a transparent background. And then from here, you could put something else underneath, like, you know, whatever color you want. You can make your own background. You could even layer this over a video clip like this. You could do that YouTube comment type of effect. And what's so cool about this is you can always go up here to browse 
and choose from a different set of photos. So look at this. I've got this album here that's actually got 59 images. And if I double click any of them, it's going to take a second for these to load in. But there you can see it's loaded up all of these images. Of course, I have zero speed. Let me go ahead and type in something like eight. And there you go. Actually, let me go ahead and cache this real quick so we can get a live preview. And there you go. You can see they're flying through space uh, pretty quickly. You probably wouldn't want to do it this quick. I'm just showing you uh, just for demonstration here. But as you can see, it successfully pulled through every single image in this album. Now, speaking of performance, as you can probably imagine, this is kind of a heavy effect, especially when you have tons of really high resolution images. So I've only tested this with up to 12 megapixel pictures. So if you can help it, I would down res your images. They're not going to be full screen anyway, so it's not like you'd really need all that resolution. So you're going to have a much better experience with a lower resolution. I would suggest something like 1080p is probably fine. Um, and the other thing that has to do with duration. So before you load any images, I would go ahead and set the duration because once you put in any images in here, like this, whenever you grab the end of the clip to adjust the duration, you're asking Resolve to preview what this frame is going to look like. And so it has to load up every image that you have in the sequence and also do all the calculations for where those images are going to be at that time. So it's just asking a lot of fusion and it could introduce a lot of lag and a less than ideal experience. So just make sure you set the duration before you load in your images. Or if you already did load in your images, you can also hit Control D and you can manually type in whatever duration you want here. That way you don't need to have Resolve preview what that last frame is going to look like. And then you would basically just go through and once the last photo scrolls through, you can simply just make a cut and delete the excess. That's going to be the safest way to adjust the duration rather than grabbing the end of the clip like this. And so the other tip I have, so like if I play this, you can see I'm getting like 13 frames per second and these are like 12 megapixel JPEGs. I'm also recording my screen. So this is the kind of performance that I would expect under these conditions. But you can also come up here to playback and set the timeline proxy resolution down to quarter. This will temporarily lower the resolution, but for me, I'm getting real-time playback even though these are 12 megapixel JPEGs and I'm recording the screen. So that definitely makes it a lot easier to preview the speed and the layout and things like that. Now, speaking of layout, one thing that you might notice when you're like in the middle of the clip like this and you try to adjust these parameters, you'll notice that they kind of feel a little bit sticky. But if you actually go to about you know, 10 frames or something into the clip, then you'll notice that these controls feel a lot more fluid. That's because it hasn't quite loaded all the images yet. It's only loaded the first 10. And so all of these controls are going to feel a lot better, even if I'm not in quarter resolution. So if I go back to full, these are the full 12 megapixel images. And you can see here I'm getting like pretty fluid control over these parameters. So your offset, your rotation sliders and everything like that are going to feel a lot better when you only have the first couple of frames loaded up. And that's really all you need to adjust the layout anyway. But if I play through this a little bit and wait to like, you know, about two seconds into the shot, uh, again, now my controls are going to be a little bit less fluid. But of course, in the quarter resolution, this is a bit better. So if you're really on a slower computer, you can go into the quarter resolution, go about, you know, 10 frames into the effect, and you should have a pretty easy time adjusting the rotation, the offset sliders, everything like that. Now here's just another little idea you could play with. I'm here on the Fusion page and you can see I've got my speed set to zero and I actually have a custom animation for my Y and my Z offset. You can see all these offset and rotation controls have the keyframe icon. Unfortunately, on the edit page, you're not able to ease these animations. You just have a straight linear animation. But here on the Fusion page, you can open up the spline editor and you can see right here, I've got position offset and I'm just looking at my Y and my Z offset controls. And you can see I just created this pretty simple animation, but it's a really kind of dynamic way to flicker through a whole bunch of photos really quick, finally landing on the one that you want to maybe talk about in your documentary or whatever project you're working on. So just another little idea I wanted to share. Uh, just, you know, these can be keyframeable, but you will have to come into Fusion if you want to create some kind of easing animation control. 
Now, speaking of Fusion, I'm gonna go ahead and just delete these nodes, and I wanna show you a little bit about what's going on under the hood here. So if I hit Shift Spacebar and look for the loader node, and we can browse for an image sequence, so let me go choose a different one, and you can see it's got these dashes, that just means it's recognized these images as an image sequence. So this does only work with image sequences, it does not work with video, but real quick, if you've got some images that kind of have like random names like this, then of course it's not going to recognize these as a sequence, but normally the way that most cameras take photos, the file names are already serialized anyway, so unless you've deleted photos or renamed them, they should already be in a image sequence by default. But just in case you've got your photos that are all kind of randomly named, maybe you're pulling together a bunch of photos from different times, different cameras. Uh, there's actually a free app for Windows called Bulk Rename Utility. I'll leave a link below. And I think this is actually built into Mac OS, but the way it works is you're gonna go ahead and select all the photos that you wanna use. Just right click and come down here to Bulk Rename here. Uh, if you rename right here using the built-in Windows File Explorer, it will actually put a parentheses at the end of each file name, and this won't work. They can't really be in parentheses like this. So anyway, we're gonna select all, right click, bulk rename here. And from here, I could arrange these by file name or date, however I want these to be arranged. And then I'm just gonna give them a name down here. So we'll just say sample photos. And under numbering, I just wanna give them all a suffix, which will automatically append a new number after each file name. So we'll go ahead and hit rename, OK and OK. And now you can see that has properly serialized the file names of all of these photos. So now if I go into my loader node, uh, now you can see it has pulled in all of them together. So if we hit play, it's just going to flicker through each photo like this. So this is really the basis for how this effect works. Now, in order to get them in 3D space, instead of using the image plane method that I shared in my older tutorial, because uh, if you do this, it's just going to flicker that image sequence on that image plane. What we can do instead is actually use the particle system. So I'm going to grab the P emitter, and we also need a particle render node, and we're going to connect these up. And let's go ahead and view our particles over here. So by default, this will just create a bunch of points, but under the style tab, you can change this to bitmap, and this will give you an image input, which you could feed your image sequence straight into like this. And if we go to the beginning, you can see there's all my images. Now at the moment, every particle is generating the exact same image in the sequence. But if we change the animate method to particle birth time, then each particle will maintain whatever image happened to exist on that frame. So if we hit play, you can see each photo in this album starts to populate in space. And we could also go into the region tab up here and expand the size. So now we kind of have like this giant cloud of all of our images. You could also change this to cube if you want separate controls for the width, the height, and the depth. So now all of our images are being populated inside of this cube. And you can see there's actually duplicates. So I can fix that by going into controls and I'm just gonna set the number here to one. And that way each image will only happen one time. Now you wanna make sure that your loader node, you don't have loop selected because this will just keep on looping through that entire image sequence. And so you will actually get duplicates if this loop checkbox is selected. So we wanna make sure that's unchecked. Now after frame 100, you'll see they start to die out. That's the default lifespan for particles. We can just increase this. And you'll notice if I hold Alt and middle mouse click to kind of orbit around, the photos are always kind of facing the camera, which I typically don't like. So under rotation, we can just uncheck always face camera. So now we can rotate around and get a better idea of how these photos are being displaced in space. So I'm gonna go back to the region tab and let's just kind of reduce the width and the depth. Now, if I just increase the height like this, you can see that our particles are still kind of randomly distributing. So to get a little bit more order, what we could do is use the P custom tool right after the particle emitter. And the P custom tool can do all kinds of advanced things related to particles. But what I care about is this particle tab right up here. So if I click into here, you can see we've got all these controls for position, velocity, rotation, spin, and all that kind of thing. Now under position Y, if we type in something like zero, this will just simply put all of our images right here in the dead center on the Y axis. If we type in one, it's gonna move all these images up a whole unit in Y space, which happens to be kind of a large distance. 
So you could also do something like 0.1 if you wanted to reduce that distance. And you could also type in ID, which will arrange each photo based on their identification number. And right now there's a large distance in between. Each one is moving a whole entire unit up. So we could just divide this by like 20, for example. And now if I play through this, you can see each photo comes in and stacks right on top of the last one. So that's a really convenient way to organize particles because like I said, by default, particles can be kind of random and chaotic. You could also type in a negative ID divided by 20 and now they'll go downward like this. And so to get them to scroll up, there's a few ways we can do that. We can actually just use the velocity control right here. So if I type in something like time, then it's just going to return the frame number right here in the Y position. So if we play this, you'll see that it actually shoots way up in space pretty quickly because again, every frame it's moving up a whole unit, which we just learned that it's kind of a, a large space. So we can divide that by like 500. And now if we zoom in here, you can see each photo comes in with a really gentle scroll upward. And from here, we can go into our particle render node and just set the output mode here to 2D. And now we basically have the effect. And I could also go to the scene control here under translation. We have this Y position slider, so we could just slide these right out of frame so that they kind of start out of frame and then eventually come into frame like this. And actually, let's go back to the particle emitter node and we're going to go to the size controls and increase the size of those particles. Now, one thing that you'll find, especially if you're using various photos from all different types of cameras, they might not always be in the same resolution. And the particle emitter node is just simply going to bring all these photos in at whatever resolution they are. So you can see this is much taller than a lot of these other ones. And if I had like a two megapixel image, it would come in much smaller than the rest of these. So to normalize the photo size, what I could do after my loader node right here is add a letterbox. And the letterbox node kind of works similar to the crop node and the resize node all together inside of a single node. And so up here, you can see I can specify the resolution and the aspect ratio of each photo. Now at the moment, every one of these is getting that exact same aspect ratio. But some of these photos were originally portraits like this bottom one right there. And I might not want to crop this photo like this. So if I change my mode here to pan and scan, then you can see it's gonna preserve all the vertical height on these portrait shots. So now you can see we've kind of normalized the sizing of each image. So this will be a lot easier to control because before, you know, this image was a lot larger. So if I turn off the letterbox node, uh, you can see these two images are pretty huge. So the letterbox node is just gonna make sure that they're all roughly the same size. And so this is basically how the effect works. And you could save this as your own template just by selecting each node, right click, create macro, and you just wanna to toggle the file name parameter that's gonna give you the option to add in uh, new photos each time you use this effect. I'm not gonna go super in depth on how to create your own macro. There are tons of videos on YouTube if you wanna learn more. And I've already created this exact template, so if you don't want to make your own, feel free to check out mine from the link below. And let me know of any way that you can see this being improved or any other ideas that this has sparked. Um, I would love to hear your suggestions, and I should probably work on literally anything else so that people don't think all I do is make slideshows.